developing the muscle of being uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. like finding comfort in discomfort, because I've, I've recognized right now, I'm kind of at a year mark anniversary of so many challenging things that happened in last year and a lot of health issues that were going on both for me and for my children. And it was a lot of stress Mm -hmm. and I've noticed, like, I don't feel good inside my body right now, but I wasn't slowing down enough to recognize why. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed I haven't wanted like candy for so long. I had all this Easter candy in my office closet that I'd been trying to hide from my kids and I didn't even use all of it for Easter. And so there was still this leftover candy. Well, it's been in there for a long time. And just in this last week, I've been like, I need candy. I want candy. (laughs) And so I had to like kind of stop and think, why? Like, what is my body trying to numb or distract Mm. itself from? And once I recognized, oh, I'm at that year anniversary where it's almost like you better hold on tight. Like this could come around again. Just this like, you know, very superficial, I guess I would call it PTSD of this is where we were last year. And those are the threats that could beset you at any time. So I guess my point in that is that we are such dynamic creatures Mm -hmm. that if you get comfortable being still at one point in your life, that doesn't mean that situation is going to perpetuate. Like you are changing, your situations are changing, the people around you are changing. And so that stillness or that being is going to be tested and stretched. Hey, Sarah, I am so excited to have you here on the podcast. I'm so excited to be able to have a conversation with you, connect with you. I know, at least I feel like I've connected with you in the last couple of months when you joined into your cycle advantage and then came on the Amplify retreat. And then then since then, now in the Flow Collective, like it's just been so amazing to get to know you and to see what you have going on in the world and how you're supporting women. And so thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. I totally agree. I've like, you have nurtured me through your sequence so well, and I'm so happy (laughs) to be here. (laughs) I love that. Like I was actually just talking to somebody this morning. I'm like, okay, I think I feel like I've got everything, like all the pieces set up, like all the things in the way I want them to go. Like I just need to drive more traffic now at this point. But so I appreciate that. I love hearing that. So tell us a little bit for those of people that don't know you, tell us a little bit about like what you do and like how you serve women and all of that. Okay. Awesome. Yes. So I am a life coach. I work predominantly with women. My particular niche is in helping women in the Christian community who struggle a lot with the symptoms of perfectionism, kind of get out of their own way and start taking some of those messy actions that need to be taken in order to break through some of the the conditioning that has kept them where they're at. And it's just so fun. I love it. So good. I know before we were hopping on, you were talking about a conversation. I think you and I had actually talked about this a few weeks ago too. in one of the calls, like shortly after it happened about this idea of like the conditioning that women are experiencing and how that shapes and changes who we are and our femininity and like how we show up and these gender roles that our society as a whole has kind of adopted and just integrated. I actually, this like whole side township, but I like saw this like reel on Instagram about this group of women that are like wanting to go back into the same gender roles and norms that we had like 50, 60 years ago. And so they're like adopting back. Like they, they're like, I don't want to be this independent career woman anymore. Like I want to go back to these like stereotypical gender norms that were existed 40, 50 years ago, where the husband is like direct head of household. He's guiding everything. She stays at home, does everything anyway. So it's just kind of an interesting take to see like how things have shifted and changed and how some women are like fully embracing this like spearhead of femininity and I'm on my own and I'm doing all these things and leaving the men behind and probably even more of like a masculine approach to femininity. And then other women are doing it differently and things like that. So what was your experience? Like, tell us a little bit about your story that kind of had you in the same sense of like questioning and asking these deeper questions around like how women show up in our femininity and things like that. Oh, I love that question. Yes. I think 
But for me, my journey started when I was young. I went through some experiences like in my early teens that required Mm -hmm. a lot of independence in me. So by the time I was like legal working age at 16, I was working full time in a corporate job setting. And I was really good operating through a masculine energy. Mm -hmm. Like I could show up, I could produce, I could get a lot of things done. I was really good at like using my brain and thinking like quickly. And so it was really interesting to me by the time I left that role, my particular job had been split into two different people who would do the same workload that I had been doing for years Mm -hmm. because I was just so strongly entrenched in that this is what you do and this is how you're supposed to show up and this is what professionalism looks like and dependability and all of these things. And it served me really well. It Mm -hmm. gave me a lot of approval and appreciation and acceptance. And it made me feel special that I could do all of these things in those roles. And then because it served me so well, I continued to take that same kind of energy into pretty much every other endeavor that Mm -hmm. I approached for years and years. And then I started feeling some like discomfort in my body, like really that dis-ease. I was Mm -hmm. uneasy. And my body has always been a really strong communicator to me. And so it wasn't something I could just kind of like ignore and disregard. And it was through kind of taking that same masculine energy and really pushing the exploration and trying to figure out, okay, what can I do to fix this? Mm -hmm. Like, that's what my mentality was. I need to fix this. And so I started kind of testing and exploring a lot of different routes. All of the things that helped me were leaning way more into my feminine energy. Mm -hmm creating practices of stillness, being able to observe, following my intuition, which was really hard for me because Mm -hmm. I felt like most of society is like, we'll go to the doctor, get an antidepressant. Like there's these prescribed methods of how you're supposed to deal with like any problems that creep Mm -hmm. up in your life. And these routes that helped me were kind of the antithesis of that. Mm-hmm. It actually made me feel a lot worse when I did the things that you're like supposed to do. Yeah. And so that was kind of like a seed that started to germinate for me in really learning how to lean into what I individually needed. And mm-hmm. not that there's any judgment. Like I think modern medicine is such a blessing and yeah. such a gift in many, many ways. But kind of like you were talking about these women that want to go back to these like very stereotypical gender roles. Awesome. More power to them if that's their choice and if they're consciously making that choice, but that doesn't mean that it's the right choice for every person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of is what helped me evolve into the work that I'm doing now with women is I really love to empower women in following that internal guidance system that we all have, but that has so often been crushed yeah, and not necessarily cultivated or nurtured Mm -hmm. into development as we've grown. Mm -hmm. And I personally believe that women have the most influence on the planet. And Mm -hmm. so when we dim that influence, that light, that spark that each of us have, that it's not just affecting our own individual lives, but Mm -hmm. it has a ripple effect on the entire planet. Like starting with the people in your home and your family and it goes out from there. And so that's kind of a a summary of where or how I got to where I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's so interesting too, because like somebody I look up to and I admire and I look to for guidance and coaching and support in my business made a comment or a statement recently around, we can't operate our businesses from a place of feeling. And I know that the idea behind it was coming from the place of like, sometimes our feelings cloud, like what the actual numbers are saying. So oftentimes we put like limiting beliefs and fears and like those things are coming into play too, when we're feeling right. So if we are looking at like, say a launch or a project, we're like, oh, I just don't feel like this is, it did really well. But when we look at the data and we look at the numbers, it's like, well, no, this actually worked really well. This worked really well, but the feeling is the thing that's guiding. And so I know that that's the the point where it came from. 
Yet I feel like this is one of the conversations that I like really having is that the masculine is more of the strategy. It is more of the numbers and how the femininity is more of the feeling and listening in. And like you said, the intuition and really using that as a guide. And I think maybe part of what has happened and why those feelings sometimes lead us astray and it doesn't always work in business is because we haven't really been taught to really listen to that. And we don't really know how to discern where those feelings and those thoughts are coming up as fear or perfectionism or as doubt or as something else versus like, no, this is truly like intuition. This is truly my feeling. And I think that that's something that I've been wrestling with and and listening into too, is I think that journey has taken me time. And I'm, I know it's taking you time too, is to like really learn to listen to that. But I think part of it too comes from asking ourselves really good questions and not just listening to a feeling and having it be this like surface level feeling, which is maybe it, maybe it is a fear. Maybe it is a doubt. Maybe it is anxiety. Maybe it is something, but like really, truly learning to listen to those like deeper feelings, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know if that. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree because I think there's almost like egoic Mm -hmm. feelings that are more superficial. Yeah. And when we talk about intuition or like an inner wisdom, that is underneath those things. Yeah. And I think I hold space for both Mm -hmm. because as humans, we're going to have those like natural fears and perfectionism and the things that we perceive as threats. And so we've got to work with that, Mm -hmm. but there is this delicate balance of not letting that rule the direction that Mm -hmm. we take and like being willing to go underneath Mm -hmm. what is really, what resonates through like the way that I like to describe it is peace. Yeah. For me, if I have a resonance of peace inside my body, that's what helps me recognize like, oh, I'm on a path of truth or like yeah. it's those little pieces of light that you like, like a breadcrumb that you can follow. Yeah. Totally what you said. Like, I think it is the lack of development of leaning into that feminine side that holds us back. I think we're all really great at the masculine side of things. Mm-hmm. Like that's been something that we've been doing for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's not like unknown territory to us. Yeah. I think we're all really good at doing and not so good at being. Yeah. And so that's the part that needs a little attention yeah. at this point. Yeah, so much so. And I think that that process of like being is so uncomfortable for so many of us, right? Like this last like week or so I've been doing tea. Like I know you were at the retreat. My sister got like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start doing tea like every morning. I'm like some mornings, like this morning, my alarm did not go off. I'm like, "Eh, not doing it this morning. But there was this moment that I had the other day where I was like sitting there drinking this tea. And I was like, why is it so uncomfortable for me here right now to sit here? Like, why is it so uncomfortable for me to be with my thoughts right now? Like, why am I feeling so agitated? Like, my mind kept going to, I have things to get done. Like there's other stuff to do. Like, why am I sitting here? Like that stillness and being okay sitting is something that like, and for me, I feel like I've done a great job of practicing meditation and doing breath work and like doing all these other things. But I still come back to those moments of like, it is still challenging to sit there and to be with our feelings and be in our space and not doing something like not checking social media or not checking email or like not cleaning up the kitchen. Like there's not doing anything and just being with myself and being willing to reflect on that and like reflect on like, what am I actually feeling? And this discomfort that I'm feeling and this frustration that I'm feeling right now, like, what is that? Like, how can I just lean into that for now? And like, let that be here and like, learn from that feeling. Like you even talked about earlier, the medical stuff that you did not always feeling that great or like the solutions that you were being given weren't feeling that great for you at that time. But I think sometimes this is even more challenging for people because it doesn't always feel easy. It doesn't always feel like the normal route. It feels kind of counterculture in a lot of ways. Like we're seeing a lot of new coming out, but like you said, we've been built into this very masculine system and very masculine success driven, go really hard and push really hard and achieve these big goals to stop and feel and be and feel good enough is kind of counterculture to a lot of that. So I think there's a lot of learning and discovering that has to happen to allow us to be okay with that. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's almost like developing the muscle of being uncomfortable. 
mm-hmm. like finding comfort and discomfort because I've, I've recognized right now I'm kind of at a year mark anniversary of so many challenging things that happened in last year and a lot of health issues that were going on both for me and for my children. And it was a lot of stress mm-hmm. and I've noticed like, I don't feel good inside my body right now, but I wasn't slowing down enough to recognize mm-hmm. why. Mm-hmm. And I just noticed I haven't wanted like candy for so long. I had all this Easter candy in my office closet that I'd yeah. been trying to hide from my kids and I didn't even use all of it for Easter. And so there was still this leftover candy. Well, it's been in there for a long time. And just in this last week, I've been like, I need candy. I want candy. <laughs> and so I had to like kind of stop and think, Why? Like, what is my body trying to numb or distract Mm. itself from? And once I recognized, oh, I'm at that year anniversary where it's almost like you better hold on tight. Like this could come around again. Just this like, you know, very superficial, I guess I would call it PTSD of this is where we were last year. And those are the threats that could beset you at any time. So I guess my point in that is that we are such dynamic creatures Mm -hmm. that if you get comfortable being still at one point in your life, that doesn't mean that situation is going to perpetuate. Like you are changing, your situations are changing, the people around you are changing. And so that stillness or that being is going to be tested and stretched. Mm -hmm. For sure. It's a constant thing. And we're constantly learning. Like I remember in this like meditation tea thing that I did the other day, I was like this feeling of rejection and like how I'm, I was like, that's never been a belief or like a fear that I've had of like being rejected, but it like came up and I was talking to my sister and she was like, I'm so glad that tea brought that up for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> like she has such a love and a fondness for the tea and like the experience and like what it's done for her in that. But I think ultimately what it is, is, is the practice of being still and just being in that moment, you know? And so I know like a big part of my like retreats and like why I host the retreats the way I do is this element of like, creating that space for both of that. Right. And I talk about it, like being all four phases of the cycle, but really at the core of it, it's like, how do we create this masculinity of like moving your business forward and getting business clarity and business goals, but yet also doing the stillness and this beingness and this inner work. And I remember when we were on a hike or we were driving somewhere and I was like in the car, I remember you and Jill talking about like, this was not the retreat we expected. Like, this is not what we were really anticipating. And I heard that actually from multiple people and some people it was very positive and some of people it was not, and it was very unexpected. And of that feeling of like, for me, like the lens of building businesses and women showing up in the world and doing the things in the world encompasses both. It encompasses this drive and this go after big goals and the strategy and the things, and also this much more inner work and the sitting and being okay with yourself and letting that evolve. So I would love for you to share like a little bit about like what your experience was with that. Like, how did that, because I know the two of you did talk about that. And I heard from people like, this was not a business retreat we've ever been like on. Like, this was not what we anticipated. And I intentionally do that very strategically because I feel like, like you said, we are very dynamic and who we are and how we show up in our business is a direct impact of what we're doing for ourselves and like how we're taking care of ourselves and whether that be our body or in taking care of our body, or if that's taking care of our mind or our soul or our spirit, or like all parts of us are showing up in our business. They're showing up in our family. They're showing up in our community. Like it's how we take care of ourselves is directly impacting the way we show up in all those places. So Anyway, I know I kind of went for a little while, but I would love to hear your take on that. Okay. Yeah. I would love to talk about this because this goes right back to really following that like inner voice Mm -hmm. because this was the first time I think, I don't even know what really switched for me. I think like at the end of the year, I was getting close to burnout and I recognized I need to feel some restoration. Like I need to pour back into my energy reserves so that I can continue doing what I'm passionate about doing. And I had leaned back into, instead of like rationalizing Mm -hmm. all of the decisions that I was making, feeling into the Mm -hmm. decisions that I was making, not from that superficial level that we talked about, but like through like a, a very like grounded place within me. And so I came across like 
your invitation to the retreat and I felt drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And so it was such a funny conversation I had with my husband. I was like, I'd like to do this retreat at this time and just want to make sure you're okay with it. And he's like, what is it? I'm like, I really don't know. I really haven't read the sales page. I don't know what it includes, but I just feel like it's something that I need right now. And he's amazingly supportive and he has learned, oh my gosh, we just listened to Sarah's gut. Whatever her gut is saying is the right direction. And so he's like, I trust you, whatever you feel like you need. And I had gone into the retreat with an intention of restoration. Mm -hmm. And when we went and it was so different than any other business retreat that you go on where it's like just a lot of push, yeah. lots and lots of push and strategy and like work. It was such a beautiful balance, like just connecting with nature and being outside and having silence was the restoration that I was looking for. But I think initially that intention of restoration was, I just wanted my energy levels back mm -hmm. to where they were. And what I got was actually some of the connections mm -hmm. that I had lost hold of from that earlier kind of evolution that I'd experienced where what really like spoke to my heart and soul in healing me and helping mm -hmm. me to be more whole were very Eastern philosophies yeah. and ideas. And when I started my business, I didn't have examples that were leading businesses from mm -hmm. that space. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of pivoted back into, well, this is how I know things work out is if you have like a really masculine energy and you hustle and you drive and you yeah. keep going with the hopes that one day things are going to slow down. And so just being there was like the reminder that I needed of like, mm -hmm. oh, remember this other way that you've discovered that works so much better for you. Yeah. And I loved it. I loved all of the exercises that you provided. What I kind of took up away from that was there's all of these different cultures throughout the world that innately recognize that stillness is valuable. Mm -hmm. And so it's helped me to lean into trusting Yeah, that like it's a little bit counterintuitive that like pulling back and slowing down yeah. is actually what helps me propel. But I've been able to take that with me outside mm -hmm. of the retreat and past the retreat and continue to lean into mm -hmm. that like internal guidance. And most of the time, it doesn't make sense why I'm doing it yeah. until like hindsight. And then yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I pursued that because all of these things came from it. Yeah. That like logically and rationally, I could have never planned or paved out that path for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so beautiful. This morning we had a new moon call in the flow collective and there, there was two other women that were at the retreat that were on that call. And it's funny that like literally this morning and now it's the same kind of takeaway. So it's like, it's beautiful for me to even hear too, is like that ability to take the stillness into your everyday life, not just in the container of the retreat. Because I think sometimes people think like, oh, I can go away. You're away from the kids. Like I came back from Sedona and I was like, oh my gosh, like Sedona was so amazing. Like maybe I need to have like a getaway house here or something because it just felt so slow. It felt so like it was like a time warp. It felt slow. It felt easeful and then whatever. On the flip side of that, I'm like, it's probably because I didn't have my kids. I wasn't going to juggling soccer and baseball and like doing all the things every day. It was just allowing me to be. And so sometimes we think like when we're in this getaway like it's going to be for that micro moment of that time that you're away that you can create this moment. But it's so beautiful to hear like all three of you that I've spoke to today, like taking that stillness into your everyday life, right? When, when sometimes we think like, how do we do this when life is busy and we're juggling soccer and we're juggling kids and we're juggling our businesses and all of these things, like how do we embody that stillness? And to hear all three of you today say like, that was one of the biggest takeaways of the retreat is to be able to do that and to cultivate that, not just in that moment, but like taking it forward. And then what insights and what value you gain out of that stillness of being able to really truly listen on that deeper level inside those moments has been really cool and really beautiful for me to hear today. That's so fun. It's yeah. so fun, like as a participant to be able to relate to other people who are kind of in that same journey too, because I think we don't get a lot of that external input yeah. where people are finding value and 
more productivity, which Mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, we're always kind of chasing that productivity through stillness. Yeah. Through slowing down. It's always like push, push, push. And so like, I know when I came home, I was like, oh, this is like a practice that I absolutely need in my Mm -hmm. life. Not that I didn't know that before. Like I am very faithful in my religion that definitely preaches like peace and pondering and praying and meditating and all of these things. But when you tap into the experience of those things in meaningful ways that are not just like I'm checking it off of the list, Mm -hmm. it hits in such a different way. And so it's been so fun, like in our group conversations to see like, oh, so-and-so is doing this and -and so-and-so is doing this because of what is like just kind of surfacing for each of us in very different ways because of that kind of like holding of the stillness. Yeah, for sure. Millie actually sent me a voice memo yesterday and she was like, I don't know what it was about that retreat or like what did, but like something triggered, like something shifted. And like, I would love to have her come on and share about her journey too, because it's just amazing to see like the shifts that, like you said, when you get into that place of stillness and you like break free, like something else, like it just creates this ripple going forward, which is so amazing. So a little bit of a different note. I know when we were driving back from Sedona, I was like driving you guys all from the Sedona to the Phoenix airport. We had a conversation in the car around your experience with PMDD. And I would Mm -hmm. love if you're willing to kind of share a little bit about like what that journey was for you and like what that experience was for you. Because I know a lot of women who listen to the podcast or like on social media, there's a lot of talk about painful periods and endometriosis and infertility and all of these things that we hold so tightly to. And like, I know everybody's experience of their, their periods is not always the most beautiful, wonderful thing that I sometimes talk it up to be. And so I think there's sometimes this pushback of, I can't really leverage my cycle or I can't really lean into it, or I don't want to trust my body in that way because it's caused so much pain and trauma to me in the past. And I know kind of some of that is a part of your journey and story. So I would love to kind of just like share a little bit about that experience for you and what leading into your cycle has looked like in that way, in that experience. Yeah, for sure. So I think that I started getting symptoms of PMDD at the time my cycle started Mm -hmm. and it looked like rebellion and like my personality had just really changed. Like the trajectory that I was on had changed. So it created a lot of discord in my very close relationships, especially Mm -hmm. in my home. And then like, as time went on, I looked back and was like, oh, it's probably anxiety and depression Mm -hmm. because PMDD is such a new addition to the DSM-5 diagnosis, you know, basically like psychological Bible, that there was no way to describe or define the symptoms Mm -hmm. that I was experiencing. And so it was always this like problem to fix, something to fight. And that was my perspective on it Mm -hmm. for many, many years. And I tried different things. My body is super sensitive, which many people who experience PMDD is like, I'm one of those women who know exactly when they're ovulating. I know what food is like Mm -hmm. not good for my body because I get weird symptoms and things like that. And so as time went on, I kept trying things from like Western medicine. And what I found was that the only things that were working were yoga and meditation and other practices of mindfulness and, Mm -hmm. and some like stuff that people would be like, Oh, that's so woo woo that you're doing this. And, and yet that was where I found some support. What the problem was, was that Mm -hmm. I would find support while I was in the practice. So I could like go to my yoga studio and I'd feel good while I was there. But then when I leave, everything like came back and it's been such a journey, but what has helped me the most is like supporting my body, like chemically with proper diet and nutrition and sleep and minerals and things like that, but also not making it a problem Mm -hmm. anymore. Like changing that perspective of honoring the communication that my body's giving me yeah, and recognizing that it's helping me understand what's going on in my internal ecosystem that nobody else can tell me. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for like external validation of what was going on. And so as I started to lean into what my body is communicating and not, not from like a judgmental or critical Mm -hmm. viewpoint, but in a truly curious viewpoint, it started to help me recognize some beliefs and some 
programs that I had received into operating from in my life Mm -hmm. that were just not really helpful or useful. And even just that leaning into going with my body instead of trying to resist those challenging times helped alleviate so many of the symptoms. So it was Mm -hmm. kind of like taking that top layer off that we sometimes heap a lot of extra suffering on ourselves with and just like removing that and being able to actually look at like the root cause. Yeah. And a lot of it is just so metaphysical. It's a lot of like what's going on in your head. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe your PMDD now? Like how do you feel like has shifted for you? I almost just want to like cry saying this. I don't think that like I could meet with any physician and they would ever say like, okay, you have a PMDD diagnosis. Like, I don't even think it would be like qualified as PMS really anymore. That's so amazing. It is. Yeah. So good. I love hearing that because it is one of those things I think for me as well, like I didn't have PMDD, but I did have these like raging, (laughs) raging bitch fests, if I want to call them that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when I would just go so angry and I would get so mad and so frustrated with my family and like say and do things that I wish I could probably take back and like all of that. And while sometimes as I go through the luteal phase, I can sometimes get a little bit more heated than normal. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I lose all self-control and sense of myself anymore. Like I don't feel that like total out of body experience anymore. And I think a big part of that is because of the same thing you're talking about, like leaning in and learning to really listen to my body and know what those cues are and like what those sensations are. And I think that's the magic, right? Like it's not just about cycle syncing in the terms of like, this is the best thing to eat during this phase. And this is the best thing to do during this phase. And this is, and like, those things are a great stepping stone into learning to trust and learning to listen to your body. But I think ultimately it is that deeper sense of like, what are those cues that your body is sending you? And like, what is it telling you? And what is it needing? And how can you lean into that and learn to trust that, that that is when things really start to make such a huge difference. Yeah, same. And I definitely experience those symptoms, but it is directly correlated to how either connected or disconnected I am exactly. from myself. Yeah. And so now if I start feeling that like agitation or edginess, instead of making it like, oh, I shouldn't feel this way, or I need to be doing this like other thing over mm-hmm. here that has my attention, I listen mm-hmm. and recognize, oh, actually, maybe I need to pull back a little bit from what I've been pushing myself to do, or maybe I need to advocate for what I need in this moment. Maybe I need to identify what I need. And it might be like slowing down a lot or changing the pace. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this like place of almost like I feel gratitude for that luteal phase, which most people are like, I hate the luteal phase, but it really is like, for me, it's yeah. a permission yes. to nurture and comfort myself in the way that my body is asking for. Yes. It's so much. Like I would agree. Like I probably in the past would have put like certain phases of my cycle being like, I don't like these. I wish I could get rid of these. And I wish I could just stay in that like go drive phase all the time because it feels good there. But now I will put that like my favorite phases are probably that luteal to menstrual phase because of how much nurturing and how much support I feel like I get in those phases now that I feel like that was the missing piece that I had for so long that that it is true. Like those become, and it's like funny. I remember having a client be like, I've never looked forward to my period before, but now after going through your program, like I'm so excited for my next period. And I'm like, I just never would have pictured that. Like that's the story. Right. So, yeah. so good. I know that you have some amazing resources for women and really like in the same vein of really like helping women learn to discover like what they actually need and like what those needs are for them and how they can start that journey too. Like, right. Like I know you've gone through your cycle advantage and now in the flow collective and things like that too. And so how is what you're using and how you're supporting women? How could they find benefit from that? Yeah. So I think what I have seen is that that connection or disconnection Mm -hmm. is the number one primary thing. And so I really want to help everyone find that connection. I've got a resource in my bio on my Instagram page that is called discovering and prioritizing your needs. Because most of the women that I talk to, they come in and I'll say, what is it that you need? Or what Mm -hmm. do you want? 
And they look at me like with a blank stare. Like, what do you mean? What do I need? What do you mean? What do I want? They've never even really learned how to identify that very basic skill. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can find a resource guide that's going to help you determine what it is that you've maybe been ignoring that you haven't been listening to, and then help you to not just like know what it is, but then take action on it and prioritize and communicate what it looks like for you to have those needs met and fulfilled. And I think there's just this idea sometimes where it's all or nothing in this like selfishness or selflessness. And that's what I want women to understand is that it's not, Mm -hmm. it is a balance that incorporates the best good for all of the people, including themselves in their lives. So go check that out on Instagram. That's free. For sure. And where on Instagram can they find you? They can find me at light path life coaching. We'll make sure to have that all cooked up in the show notes too. So people can just grab it there. Anywhere else people can find you or anything else that you want to leave us with at the end of this episode? You know, I think my Instagram page will give you links to anywhere else that they can find me. If you want to email me or, you know, want to talk directly, you can reach me at Sarah at lightpathcoaching.com. But the last message I would like to leave is for your listeners to understand that they're okay. Like regardless of whatever challenge they might be facing right now, if you take a step back, gain a little bit wider perspective, there's probably things you're missing when you're looking at the problems, like right up in your face and everything's okay. They're okay. It's going to be okay. For sure. So good. I love that. We are all okay. Yes. We're actually like way more than okay. Like we're pretty amazing. So agreed. Yeah. Yeah. 